Okay, welcome to this session. I'm Marlene Graff. I'm a member of the ETE committee, and I get to introduce our presenter, Nathan Smith. Um, Nathan is a former elementary teacher and is now the Director of Technology Integration for the College of Education and Human Services. He also directs the Dell and Dell Young Education Technology Center, which is a student open access lab, K through 12 curriculum library, a NASA Regional Educator Resource Center, and a technology training center. Nathan serves on the board of directors for the Utah Co Coalition of Educational Technology. He has worked extensively with groups of international teachers throughout the through the IREX T program from the U.S. Department from the U.S. State Department. In 2013, he trained educators in Lebanon and Jordan to integrate technology and use open education resources. So we're thankful that he's here today, and I'll turn the time to him. Thank you. Let me get wired up. Come on in. All right. Um, I have a handout. If any of you didn't receive one, raise your hand and I'll make sure you get one, all right? Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here this morning. This is really informal. Uh, questions are, are, are welcome. Uh, let me just start by asking a question, all right, that I got asked a few years ago, and it really made me think, all right? The question is, if a student can Google it, should we teach it? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, it, it denotes, yeah, it denotes, a, it denotes a change that's occurred over the past couple of decades, hasn't it? Um, you know, when, when we first started into our traditional academia, uh, we were the content specialists, aren't we? We still are, but... The content has become ubiquitous. I mean, we all carry it around with us. Um, you know, okay, Google, <laughs> and then ask the question, right? Well, what does that mean for teachers and teaching? How many of you are teachers in here? Almost every one of you. Uh, so what does that mean for us as teachers when knowledge becomes ubiquitous? Well, it's, it's now it's less about how to get the knowledge Right. So how do you, how do you teach them to find it? Yeah. Find the right stuff? Our role is changing, isn't it? Um, in a lot of ways. Uh, back in May, I was tasked by the dean's office to come up with uh, an updated course for uh, technology for educators. And uh, it gave me the opportunity to put some things together that I've been having rolling around in my mind for the last... 36 years in my, in my educational experience. Tom, welcome. And so here's a, a handout for you. So what I want to do today is I'd like to share the course that I've developed because it is publicly accessible. I've made it uh, available under the Creative Commons license, and there are a lot of resources for you there as a teacher. But... Uh, uh, I also want to kind of describe how I've, how I've uh, designed the course to reflect some of these new standards that are coming out. Now, um, we're, we, we, we needed to uh, produce a course that would help our college uh, meet the CAPE standards for accreditation. And those are, are internationally, international standards 
we're looking at the ISTE standards here. In fact, I've got the, the brand new student standards on that handout for you. And, you know, back in the 1990s, those standards were learning to use the tools. And so our, our course in the College of Education was basically a tools-centered course. How do I blog? How do I use Word? How do I use Excel? And, and so forth. Um, but over time, those standards have changed. Now the standards focus on transforming education with technology, all right? And that's a big change. And so, as you'll notice, the standards for students on your page aren't about tools anymore. They're about character traits that we want our students to become, all right? Empowered learners, communicators, uh, global collaborators, um, <clears throat> and similar types of things, innovative. And so how do we do that with our students in our course and how, how do we model that in our course? So um, this is the course that's uh, currently being offered in instructional technology and learning sciences as a 5,500 course there. Next year, it'll be a, a TEAL 5,500 course. Hi, how are you? Come in. And it will be the required course. Uh, we're going to start with elementary ed, and then secondary ed, and special ed, and hopefully get our principal's academy involved in this as, as well. So the design of the course is focused all around the ISTE standards. So um, <clears throat> if I go into the experiences, let me see if I can make those just a little bigger so that, so we start out by uh, sharing with them what voices are saying about what 21st century education should look like. And then we go into all of these standards. So you'll notice that we focus on fostering creativity, learning, and uh, innovation, and then all the substandards under that, designing and developing digital age learning experiences and, and so forth. And so in each of these sections, what we, what we wanted to do in the design of this course was to focus on the big idea and to show students what that looks like in, in schools that are currently implementing these kinds of, of standards in their teaching. And some of them uh, uh, really get outside the traditional box of education. Uh, so, for example, uh, and, and then, excuse me, I'll come back to that. For example, uh, we, we then share tools and, and online resources that are commonly available to, to them as idea starters. Now, the, the, the goal of the course over the period of the semester is to have our students step outside the traditional role of education. Uh, we've all been very well schooled in that traditional model, haven't we? Um, I'd like to share a quote with you from uh, uh, Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith. Who uh, Tony Wagner is one of the big voices in education about innovation and and. Uh, he says, for the last century, the classroom experience for most students has revolved around lectures, note-taking, recall-based recall tests and grades. Clubs, sports, and social interaction were regarded as providing a welcome break from the intense learning process. We will see, however, that most lecture-based courses contribute almost nothing to real learning Consequential and retained learning comes to a very large extent from applying knowledge to new situations or problems, research on questions and issues that students consider important, peer interaction, activities and projects. 
experiences rather than short-term memorization help students develop the skills and the motivation that transforms lives. And, uh, and so how can we do, how can we change that thinking? That's what this course is, is, is all about. And so in the design of the course, we, we split it into two, into two parts, all right? We have the content online that's publicly available to anybody in the world uh, at the Weebly website. Have any of you used Weebly before? What do you like about it? Yes. Uh -huh. So if you want to create a website, and on Weebly you can create up to 10 free websites, unlimited pages, all right? Weebly is both a free version and a paid version, and it's just drag and drop, simple. I need text here, I need a picture here, I need a YouTube video here, and when you hit publish, it's live to the world. With, uh, with the address, the URL that you've chosen. And so this has been a great tool for, for my classes that I've, that I've integrated into mine. Uh, I teach three courses at the university, uh, beginning uh, Photoshop and graphic design, advanced Photoshop and graphic design, and now this course that, uh, that we're going to start this fall. And it's been, uh, uh, the feedback from the students has been great. Uh, most of my classes are blended, meaning I have distant students uh, doing it online, and I've, had, I've got face-to-face -face students uh, in the classroom with me. And my face-to-face -face students, this kind of surprised me, but my face-to-face -face students really like having that available online for them too because they can come back and constantly review. And since I've put them on Weebly in their public, after they graduate, they can still come back to them and review and learn whenever they want to. So that's been a, a, a real selling point for my students. Um, so, sure. So are you suggesting then that as we look at our courses that we teach, that it would be worthwhile for us to look at having a public content portion of it, say on a web page on Weebly, that we would then interact with our students and help them understand the knowledge, rather than just putting it, say, in Canvas, which is private. Right. Well, and I've learned that in Canvas, if you talk with the CD folks, you can make some, some or all of your Canvas content public in the, in the commons area. Have any of you done that? That'd be something to look into, yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, and, and the reason why I'm doing this this way, why I put it publicly, is because I want to impact teaching all across the board, all right? And so as the students go through this course and we have discussions on Canvas that are going on all the time on how to step out of the box and how do we, how do we innovate and things, plus the content online. When they, when they get to their student teaching phase and they're out with the cooperating teachers, this is public for their teachers. So as, as they collaborate with those public ed teachers, they can say, oh, let me share this, uh, this great idea I learned in class, and here's the website, and you can go, go find it out yourself, all right? Um, it also becomes a talking point for, uh, for educational faculties to say, okay, how do we uh, create an environment where students learn in a, in a very sticky, productive kind of way? In this converted Navy facility near the San Diego airport, 
thoughtfully applied technology is transforming public education. We're going to want to focus on the advertising throughout the school. Oh. They're doing things, they're producing things. So the purpose of tech in High Tech High is not for consumption, it's for production. A former high school carpentry teacher with a law degree, Larry Rosenstock, became founding principal and CEO of High Tech High in 1998. I tell our visitors who come here, stop any child that you want, grades 6 through 12 at random, and ask them what they're working on and watch what happens. They'll look you in the eye and they'll talk to you about what they're working on. So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to make a, a movie or like a documentary on everything we learned. So we're learning about physiology, but we're also learning about like After Effects, which makes like videos and stuff. So bring them together. High Tech's 2,500 students gain entrance by lottery and represent a cross-section of San Diego's public school population. Okay, trace it out. And whether they choose to focus on the arts or sciences, all of them are engaged in rigorous yeah, projects. Yeah. And one thing we want to be careful of is that we don't add your DNA to these samples and you come out in the end with your DNA barcode. In an 11th grade biology class, students are developing a DNA barcoding process that will help African law enforcement officials convict poachers. These are photos that I got last week from one of our collaborators in Nairobi. This is in Eland. I know everyone's really serious about it because it's a serious issue, but this is really a lot more fun than you'd be able to do in any other classroom. A lot of people donate stuff right, just because like, we're our nonprofit. Right, right. Whenever possible, projects are designed to serve the local community. Whether it's creating a storage system for the YMCA, we have a new storage facility that right. we could actually take this out, right. or designing an assistive technology device. She used it for the first time and moved that bar up and down the paper for the first time herself. Her eyes just lit up. It was the first time she'd been able to do something on her own, and it was just. The, the students were tremendously touched, I was touched. It was just a really amazing experience. What's going on here? That's a fat that builds up. Instead of grades on high-stakes tests at the end of the year, students are assessed on an ongoing basis. Well, assessment is not an end point. It's not an end activity. It's something that goes on moment to moment. So teachers are always checking for kids' understanding and so forth, and we're always asking kids to, in a lot of different contexts, to kind of describe what it is they're working on, what is they've discovered, what their plan is for the next day, and so on. So assessment is folded in. Good work, guys. All right, thank you. They are also judged on their individual digital portfolios and their stand-and-deliver presentations of learning. I'll start this presentation of learning today with math and physics, followed by Spanish 1 and finishing off with humanities. Instead of taking finals at our school, we do POLs, which is a presentation of learning, where we get up in front of the whole class and, and the teachers and a whole panel of people and tell them exactly like what we learned this year, how it can be applied to the real life, and how you've developed in critical thinking or developed in other things. Students are also assessed on their contributions to group projects, like books on the ecology of San Diego Bay. These are really high quality efforts by kids, as opposed to memorizing 3,000 biology words to prepare for the AP exam. We want kids behaving like scientists and behaving like photographers and behaving like graphic artists. The high-tech model is working. Point one, which is, is that line? The original one. high school has grown into a network of eight public charter schools. And maybe you could put that same kind of text here, here, and there. And 100% of high-tech high graduates are accepted to college. I really believe in this place. I, I, I've been here since the beginning, and I think it's, it, it is absolutely the true way to learn. And the brown is fine in the background? Yeah, the brown is fine, as long as you put those words in. Okay, okay. Okay. For more information on what works in public education, go to edutopia.org. So I tried to show examples of schools that are doing things a little bit differently. The student's goal is to create a portfolio of 15 deeply engaging experiences that they can engage their own students with. What I'm trying to do with them is to say, you know, in our, in our current academic situation, we're marching through content and assessing and marching through more content and assessing. And our students are bored. They're dropping out. 
what I'm trying to get them to do is to say, let's make content secondary. Let's make the primary goal be the experience, the engagement piece that we need to, that we need to engage our students with. No matter what that experience, that's the hard part to come up with, but no matter what that experience is, we can take any content that we want and embed that into the experience itself so that becomes a part of the experience. And then let's have our teachers find and research the, the technology and implement that that will help that experience be successful. So often in our schools, it comes the other direction. You know, we have money. We're going to get one-to-one -one iPads. We're going to push it down to all the teachers in all the schools. And the teachers are already up to here, busy. And they say, OK, what do we do with them? <laughs> and they end up sitting at the back of the room gathering dust. However, if, if a teacher worked this way, where they designed the experience, embedded the content, then figured out what technology would make that successful. They've done the research already. They can go to the administrator and say, this is what I need, and I already know what I want to do with it. It will be used, all right? So that's, that's the goal of the course, is for the students to come up with 15 deeply engaging. We'll have students coming in from 64 different isn't that right? 64 different uh, uh, professional fields from biology to health. Uh, you know, uh, we want this to be relevant and meaningful to them. All right. So what will happen is that uh, we'll introduce a standard, and then the students will do some research and also uh, design this experience that, that they want. We'll bring these together as a group, and, and in Canvas, we'll have discussions about what they've developed. And we'll work as a team or a cohort to critique each other and to help each other you know, even up the ante a little bit more. Once they have had an opportunity to update and revise these experiences based on the critique that they've received, then we will make them public to the, to the world. And so we'll have 400 students a year, each doing 15 deeply engaging experiences that we will put into, will be net producers. We'll, we'll put them out there for educators worldwide. I talked with a company a week ago uh, called participate.com that uh, uh, are so excited to have these. Participate.com is, is a, a worldwide educators forum where teachers globally can chat with each other through tweets, and also where they can share resources that are connected to uh, their standards and objectives to whatever countries uh, they, they reside in. And our students will be adding to that collection uh, for a worldwide audience as, as well. Um, so in, in every way, we're trying to engage them. I'm trying to be a role model in, in the way that they, uh, in the, what I'm trying to teach them to do uh, by having them engaged with a worldwide community, having them work on experiences that are personally relevant and meaningful to them. I want them to come out of the course ready to hit the ground running, uh, so to speak. Questions? That's basically it in a nutshell. So I have a question. So you, in one of the examples there, you talked about how just pushing technology down doesn't help teachers because they're already up to here with what they're expected to do. So when you're looking at adding the, you know, the technology into the education, does that, um, that, does the technology insist the teacher in reaching more people or does the engagement require that you interact with less people? Because in a sense, when you talked about the old-fashioned way, if the teacher's the source of the content, it's one person you can deliver it to as many as you want, uh -huh. and then you just got to grade them somehow. So uh -huh. the, what, what you showed in that video, that's a lot of engagement with perhaps needing more time with the students. Yes. 
And so when you talk about these technology things, does that, my question is, is that, you can't give the instructor more time because he doesn't have, or he or she doesn't have more time. But have teachers ever had more time? <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Um, it really depends on the field you're trying to teach in, all right? If, if you could, what, what field are you coming from? Science. Science, okay. So if, if you could have an opportunity to engage your students um, using technology that would make the experience more meaningful to them, that's, that's the key right there is how, how do you engage them so it becomes deep, sticky learning. Uh, for example, um, a professor back east has developed a virtual laboratory. So the students are wearing VR goggles, virtual reality goggles. They're in a laboratory in 3D and they can control the environment using chemicals that could be dangerous and explosive in a real environment but it's all in a virtual reality. So they get, to, they get to play just like they would in a real lab, but if something blows up, they just <laughs> go like that, you know? So uh, if you had that kind of thing, would that be something that would be productive for your students? Yeah, it would, but it's, you know, it's, that seems to be, someone else is gonna have to develop that it's like already developed. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, what I'm thinking about is there a way that you can engage the students using technology that takes up less of my time rather than more of my time. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part. That's where we have to sit down and think. But the but the beginning point is what's more important to me? Is it marching through content and assessing, or is it? productive learning with my students in a, in a very engaging way. And I think there are, are things that you could do that would, that would work well. Uh, for example, the Photoshop and graphic design uh, classes that I teach, I ask myself, what experience do I want my students to have? Well, I want them to have Photoshop and graphic design experiences. So I go out and I find clients a client that needs a flyer or a brochure made or a client that, that needs a, a digital display created for uh, something that they want to put up or uh, a poster or something like that. And the clients interact with my students saying, here's what I need. And then I help the students by teaching them the Photoshop skills and the graphic design principles that they're going to need to have in order to create that piece for the client. And, and it's worked very well. Um, so the students handed in, it's okay to flop because we're going to talk about all these pieces they handed in and give, give some critique and talk about design and everything. And then we hand it back to them and say, okay, uh, fix it, <laughs> all right? And then they, they turn them in again and we grade them on a rubric. And I often have them self-grade on a rubric too, I, I give them the rubric and say, okay, what would you give yourself on this and why, you know? And the feedback that I get at the end of the course every, every semester is that, wow, this was really fun. I got to do real world work. I think I'm ready for the real world now, all right? And several of my students have, have uh, gotten jobs in graphic design, even though they were in some other program, you know? Most of my students are in uh, public relations or marketing or things along that line, and this course has helped them on their way. I have just a few minutes left before we quit. Uh, let me show you a couple of things about this that, that would be of help to you. I designed this to share, <laughs> all right? Uh, and so um, in the experiences section, I list out all the all the big ideas that we're trying to incorporate in our teaching. In the resources section, 
I have links to all the Canvas tutorials, both for teachers and for students. I figure we want to help our students who are becoming educators be able to learn and use Canvas as an educator rather than just on the student side. Um, these are wonderful in case you want to embed these in your courses. There are videos on how to do discussions, how to do uh, uh, submit assignments, whatever. So that's a, that's a great thing. So what, what we've done is, as we've gone through, we've mentioned a, a number of different potential tools that they could use that, uh, uh, and so what we've done is we've indexed them all in alphabetical order, and then we've uh, cross-linked them back into the course where they were mentioned so they could see the context in which the, the tool was, was mentioned. So that's a great list of, of some great tools that you could use uh, in science and in other, in other professional fields that, uh, that would uh, help you. We've got links to the, the standards, but also what we've, what we've done is for many of these tools, we've gone out and looked for places that teach how to use the tools because as the students uh, decide and, and research on a tool that they'd, they'd like to incorporate, we're going to have them share resources on how they, how they use. So when, when these experiences get put out to the world, we want any teacher in the world to be able to say, oh, this is what I want to teach. This is what, how I want to engage my students. Here's the tool that I can use. Here's where I can learn how to use the tool. And this is what I need to do just to get up and running with it so a teacher can take that piece and, and actually, actually do it. So we've, we've got those there. We have uh, links into the library so that they can do, they can connect with uh, uh, resources for research and then links for places that you can go and search for tools that are relevant to you. Um, anyway, this is, this is all available to you uh, as well on the back of your on the back of your uh, handout, I have other resources for you. I've got links to my Photoshop and graphic design classes, which are also available to the entire world. And anybody that wants to, to learn Photoshop and graphic design without having to pay for credit to do it can do so. All right. Um, we've put a couple of, uh, spent a lot of time this summer. Uh, we've, we've had other websites that we put together. You'll notice they're all Weebly sites. Uh, phenomenal websites was uh, put together for a summer citizens course, which just lists a bunch of really cool <laughs> educational websites for, for senior citizens and adults. And then the gifted and talented resources uh, we put together for Scott Hunsaker's class over in the College of Education. He teaches gifted and talented education. And uh, again, it's a, it's a great uh, uh, resource farm for uh, resources that you can get into from, from different areas. Then we run TeacherLink. Uh, you're welcome to come over to the YETC anytime. It's over in 170 Education Building. Basically, my role boils down to, Nathan, I'm looking for fill in the blank, or Nathan, I need help with fill in the blank on some technology piece. And that's the kind of technology training we, we do and, and provide. And so you're welcome to just come in on a one-to-one -one basis. Are there any last questions I can, I can answer for you in the last minute or so that we have together? Has this been helpful to you? Well, it's probably not a one-minute question, but okay. how do you adapt things like that to large classes? Everything I see with all the other kids, it's always like 15 students. Mm -hmm. I got 120. Yeah, I'll have four. I'll have 400 a year that'll go through this course that I've just developed. Part of it is you have to kind of step out of the traditional box a little bit and say, okay, the box I've been in has asked me to do this, but is that really the smartest way? You know, 
as, as elementary school teachers, one of the quest first questions I asked was, why do we take kids out of the real world, put them in an artificial environment, group them by age, and then try and teach them about the real world, you know? <laughs> um, how do I step out of the box? How do I bring the real world back in? Um, and so when I was an elementary school teacher, art specialist, I'd invite professional artists in and they would teach them uh, skills. And then I'd convince them in donating a, a piece to the, to the school. So we ended up with a gallery of fine art in the, in the school that the children could look at. But that's, that's the thing. We have to give them grades. Do we have to correct every single one? Can they self-assess? Can they peer assess? Um, those are things you have to, you have to look at and, and consider. That's what I'm considering for these. Anyway, I'm, I'm out of time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>